Friends did school was mostly negative. TV and movies mostly negative. That's what I saw. In terms of your feeling very so same thing for I have multitude of friends. very I guess you got more experience than that. Well, we first came to Wisconsin. for a year. I mean, No, no. Well, you can suggest that you know, when Okay, <laughs> they <laughs> 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 like <laughs> 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 I think the people in the I TV, the news, I'm too ashamed to say it. I don't think it's interesting to know what other people work on. Like, okay, like for example, there's like some kind of a, like, what do you have to do? All right. So, uh, you can bring our conversation back in. I, 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 I,
So she would have been but she's obviously you know, and she wouldn't care if I didn't But I mean those things still like because I remember that song is when we if you can hear my voice, clap once. If you can hear my voice, clap twice. All right, great job. Thank you so much. Um, so I, um, I want to address something that is um, that I felt in the room. Right. And so, and I don't know if you guys felt it or, or noticed um, some, some disagreement, kind of uneasiness in, in the room uh, as we're kind of going over some of these, these concepts. And I, I just want to say this, what the system has done to us is not fair. It's not right. And it's none of our faults. It's not of our faults, and and it's so funny. I remember in a um, I went to this camp in uh, called Camp Minnewanka in uh, in Shelby, Michigan. You know, those camps always have those weird little pseudo native names, right? And uh, and, and I went there. We were having a great time, and they had uh, one day they dedicated to diversity. So here are all these kids and we're getting along, we're having a, a great old time. And I recall the woman gets up and she starts talking about diversity and I stand up and I say, why are you trying to mess it up? Because we had a utopia. <laughs> we had our own little utopia. And she says something to me, Carolyn uh, Gould, Carolyn Gould. Wow, they came back. Carolyn Gould, she said, I'm not messing anything up. I'm just bringing the truth. And so it is not my aim to, to be hurtful or to, to make people feel belittled or, or any kind of negative feeling. It is, it, is, it is difficult to shine the light on the truth because it's, uh, it can sometimes be ugly. Can you read the 14th Amendment to the Constitution for me? And I just need the first sentence. Section one. Yep, section one. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. Uh, section two. Oh. Is that the 14th or the 13th? I, I gave you 14th. I'm sorry. Yeah. Let's go to 13th. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I was thinking maybe you meant the 13th. Yeah, I meant the 13th. I apologize. <laughs> All right. Let me find it. Sorry. <coughs> I was hoping. Oh, I got it. Okay. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as punishment for crime. Stop. Re rewind. Yep. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, comma, except as a punishment for crime. Okay, stop right there. So if we're if we're a nation about about justice and about equality, why do we need an accept? Why are our clients battling with so much stuff? Because they are the accept. As you were going through your, your pluses, your minuses, and your zeros, were there things that you thought of or that came up to came up for you as you were going through that process? I don't need to know what you have pluses, minuses, and zeros in, but but were there some thoughts that came up to you as you were trying to fill that out? And what were some of those thoughts? How horrible the media is. How horrible the media is. <laughs> Did other folks find that yeah. too? That you're like the oh, media is really horrible. Yeah, what is their job? What's their job? Get your attention. Get your attention. <laughs> they take stereotypes. They magnify them, and then they shove them down your throat, right? You know, Mexicans can only be one or two things, a, 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 a drug lord or a, or a farm worker, right? You know, uh, Asian. all Asian men are good at karate and math, right? 
Blondes are dot dot dot. Right? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Right? But this idea, this idea that um, that whatever we learn is not our fault. It's not our fault, right? So you know, um, you know, I heard some folks talk about growing up in rural areas, right? That's not your fault. Growing up in in uh, places that you would now you would now see as an adult were not healthy or or racist or or whatnot. Uh, that's not that's not your fault. I was in a play called when I was in high school called the Mikado, uh, Gilbert and Sullivan's Mikado. Is anyone familiar with that at all? Right. So so yeah. So I loved it, loved it. I was I was the Mikado, right? You know. Uh, wait, 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 wait. This is 30 years ago. <laughs> My arms are also blind. I shall achieve in time. Let the punishment fit the crime. The punishment, right? I was doing all this whole thing, and I had I had a Fu Manchu uh, thing on, and I had I was in all of this Asian garb, and it was in the thing, and the adults that 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 led me on that journey were like, "Yes, go for it. You're doing it. Yeah, we love it." And I'm like, "Ah, you know." So I'm just a maniac on that. I, I go back and I watch it as an adult. And I'm mortified that the adults around me would let me participate in something so <laughs> clearly racist and dehumanizing in the name of good performance. So no, we all that, that's not my fault that they did that to me. That's not that my fault that they encouraged me to participate in those things and they rewarded me for, for that. But now as an adult, it is now my responsibility, right? So however we grew up, whatever context we came out of, it's not our fault, but it's our responsibility. How many of you drive a car, ridden in a car? Does it have blind spots? And where are they typically? So behind the, 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 the seats, where else? Where are the blind spots? Right over your shoulder, okay. Sometimes the, the front. You know, clearly the underneath could be a blind spot. And if you drive a Hummer, the whole thing is a blind spot, right? Is it your fault? No, but it is your responsibility. And so how do you find out about blind spots? There's two ways to find out. Something. Right? Or you can, yeah, you can look for them. You have to look for something that you don't know exists. And that while? Right? So it's not your fault, but it is your responsibility. And so as, as folks, so, so I've had to look at my own stuff. I had to be a, a critical thinker about my own behavior, my own actions. And this is what, what I've come to. I've come to understand that we still have discrimination and it is, we have discrimination because of bigotry and prejudice. And when folks have encountered a bigot, oh, what's the archetype for, for bigotry? That most of us uh, grew Archie up watching Bunker. on when Archie Bunker, right? <laughs> Archie Bunker on uh, on uh, Family, uh, All in the Family, right? So, so he grew up watching that, and so Archie uh, was was America's favorite bigot, and he had somebody in his life that was always trying to bring him truth and reality and facts and figures and data and statistics. And who was that? That was his son-in-law, Mike, right? Uh, Rob Reiner, right? And so, so Rob Reiner would try to bring him information. And why was that? What was Rob Reiner's, or, 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 uh, or Mike, or Meathead, as Archie liked to call him, what was his diagnosis of Archie's problem? That he was a bigot. And what else? That he was ignorant. Right? So, so when I've encountered bigots, I've thought the same thing. I said, these people are just ignorant. So I bring data, statistics, charts, graphs. And what does the bigot do when I do that? They dig in. They dig in until they're tired of hearing me come with my data. And then they tell me what's wrong with them. They say, Andre, I don't care what you say. This is how I feel. Oh, big.
bigotry is an emotional state. So how do you help someone move or shift emotional states? <coughs> how do you help them? Educate. You educate them. So education helps get a friend who's got the blues out of the blues. Sometimes. Does that work with you? I don't know. <laughs> she said, I don't know. <laughs> right? No, what do you do with a friend that is sad? What do you do? And I'm not talking about clinical depression. I'm saying the, the, the blues, the sadness. Just what do you do with them? You hang out with them. You sit with them. What else? You cheer them up. You listen to them. You go do things. You 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 you, you try to bring some joy to their lives. You love them. Wait a minute, dude. Are you suggesting that to help a bigot? I have to love them? Yes. So, so, so the, the example, family members. I have family members who are not politically correct. I, I know you don't have any of those family members, but I have those family members, right? And, 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 and it is, it, I remember my parents saying this kind of stuff. Uh, my mother would be like, is, uh, is Joe going to be at the, at the family thing? And my dad would be like, yes, Joe's going to be there. She's like, the, the kids are, we, we're not going there because he is totally inappropriate. He's blah, 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 blah. And my dad would say, I know he's all that, but he's my uncle. And so we would go. Now, the interesting thing about that is that, that, that my, my dad would constantly make us, make us go. But I didn't understand why until, until I got older. Because my dad knew something that my mom did not want to recognize which was that Uncle Joe doesn't get better without us. So even though he, he tells the jokes and he's, but, but if we cut Uncle Joe off, he gets worse without being close to us. And so when I talk about this idea of the, the, the bigot and, and, and loving them, what I mean is you tether yourself to them. Now the tether can be very long, <coughs> but you're tied to that person. You don't let them go. You hold them accountable. Um, because that's the that's the only way we, we get rid of, of, of bigotry. Because what we know is bigotry is an emotion. Prejudice is a thought. I remember a show called Perry Mason, and Perry Mason is my number one favorite uh, attorney in um, in Private Eye slash Private Eye. Columbo is my is my number two. Love love Peter Falk. Well, I are. he would just see all sorts of stuff. So Perry Mason walks in. Anybody familiar with Perry Mason? Okay. So Perry Mason is an is attorney slash kind of private eye. So he uh, he goes into the courtroom and people are like, oh, Perry's here. And like, you know, the hush falls over the court. And so uh, Perry walks in. He nods to the, to the judge. The judge nods back. He looks at the other attorney. The other attorney sneers. And so, and so Perry takes his it takes his place and he asks the judge. He said, "May I may I approach the witness?" And uh, and, and, and the judge says, well, go right ahead, Perry. And now the people are all hushed in the crowd because they're excited about what Perry is going to do. So Perry walks over to the witness. And Perry had noticed something in the witness's testimony that the witness had left out. And so Perry said, I want to bring this up because I think this is the key to this whole case. So he goes up to the witness and he says, I read you the, the thing and you said that this, is this true that such and such happened. And then uh, the, the other attorney go, gets irate. He's like, I object. And now the whole courtroom is in an uproar. And the judge is like, order in my court, order in my court. And people calm down. And, and the judge says, that overrule is sustained. And Perry says, I'm sorry, I withdraw the question. Wait a minute. Perry is the coldest. Why would Perry Mason <coughs> ask that question and then withdraw it? To put it out there for what? For everybody to hear. For everybody to hear and what? And think about. So how do you help prejudiced people? You get them to think. Mom, are there other news stations that might have Another take on what just happened? Where did you read those statistics about that thing? 
Did you ever get a letter from an employer saying that we did not hire you because we hired uh, a Corinne person? <laughs> right? You start asking these questions. What happens to the prejudice person? Danger, Will Robinson. Danger, danger. <laughs> Cannot compute. Right? They, they, they start. They start breaking down because they they don't have anything, and then they 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 back up into the bigotry. Right? So what do we know about emotions plus thoughts? <laughs> what do they dictate? Action. What entity said they would deal with discrimination? I'll give you a hint. government it said it would deal with discrimination if it had you walk down the hallway and, and a co-worker uh, swats you on your behind and grabs what do we call that sexual, sexual harassment and what happens no, <laughs> oh, <Lord. laughs> don't let my attorney find out right now what happens, I hold. I am. <laughs> what happens? Well, it's Maybe somebody might get fired, HR gets involved, they go down to legal proceedings. And what if they start these investigations and legal, legal, legal proceedings and the person says, you know what, I was just joking. Can't you take a joke? Does that stop anything? No, right? Because it's not about the intention, it's about the impact. And so when we talk about this idea of discrimination, the government said if discrimination happens, we have a process for that. We'll take care of that. Who's responsible for how people feel and what people are thinking? Who's responsible for those? We are. So since 1964, we've had no more discrimination. <laughs> we can't celebrate, can we? Why? Why do we still have discrimination? Because people still have these emotions and they have these thoughts. And we're not challenging them. We have discrimination because we're not doing our jobs. I was at a, uh, I was at a, uh, <laughs> I was at a dollar store. Love the dollar store. Love the dollar store because I can afford everything <laughs> in it. <laughs> Makes me feel good about myself, right? So I'm in the dollar store, and uh, there's, there's a couple in front of me. Uh, uh, a young lady with pajama pants and house shoes on and silk wrap on her on her head and there's a young man um, who is uh, who's with her and he has on a t-shirt and his underwear start here but his pants start here right and so uh, so they're, they're standing in line and she pulls out her, an apple juice out of her cart and puts it on the counter while something catches his attention right so he's looking at some shiny thing over over here and while he's looking at that she also pulls out her EBT card or snap card are you guys familiar with electronic benefits okay so 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 she's in mid swipe he turns around and he says you stupid boop how the boop are you going to use our card for boop and it's just cussing her out right and everybody in the store does the same thing i do we start checking prices at the dollar store. How much is this? <laughs> yeah. Right? Why do we do that? What are we saying to ourselves? This is none of my business. Unfortunately, I have this little voice that always things I'm not capable of doing on my own. And the voice says, say something. And I'm like, are you nuts? No, I'm, I'm not get involved with this but then I make a deal with the voice I said you know what once I'm done purchasing my stuff if they're still uh, outside I'll say something so I'm taking my time you know and and so finally I get my stuff and I go outside and they're still there and um, and so uh, so I follow them into uh, into a grocery store now what I know about people that I don't know is you don't walk up to a stranger and tap on the shoulder from behind and say I want to talk to you right that's a recipe for disaster yeah. so I walk around the aisle and meet this guy face to face now the voice was very encouraging he was very encouraging the voice said um, say something so so now I'm here in front of this dude 
and I'm getting nothing from the voice, no nothing. And so I'm standing there and I'm stalling, trying to figure out what to do, what to say, because but my fear is if I say the wrong thing, what's gonna happen? She's gonna get hurt. No, I'm okay. I can handle it. <laughs> the funny thing is, you fight like that, people won't punch you. <laughs> no, I can. I can handle it. So, so, so I was afraid that something might happen to her. And so, so, so the voice gives me what to say. Now I'm relieved. I'm excited. I'm happy because I know the voice. I trust it. And so I open my mouth, and this is what comes out, sir. If you want her to grow, you have to water her and give her sunshine. <laughs> I repeat it, not for him, but for me. And I said, sir, do you know what I mean? And he says, yeah, I do. All right, sir, have a great day. I'm out of here, right? And it took me a long time to figure out why the voice was compelling me to speak because I thought I was going in defense of this, this woman. Uh, and, and I thought maybe I was trying to teach this guy something. But, but what came to me was the baby. I was interacting with, I was interrupting for them on behalf of this baby. See, sometimes we get confused and we think that the, the, the person that we're actually helping is the person in front of us. But we don't realize is that we could be helping break, in, break off generational poverty, generational trauma, generational stress when we give people the skills that they need. And we don't offer people humanity. L last story, it was at, at, a, um, at a restaurant. And uh, I, I live in Moundsview. I don't know if you know where Moundsview is. It's a little north of here. And... Uh, this place had a great walleye sandwich, great walleye. So, so I go in uh, Saturday, 10 o'clock, and uh, I notice that there's a guy at the end of the bar who's red-faced and drunk, Saturday at 10 o'clock. So I know a lot about this dude already, right? And so I close my menu, and the guy moves from the end of the bar and sits next to me. And I do what any good Minnesotan would do, and we start talking about the weather. So we start talking about the weather. And then he breaks into the thesis as to why he sits next to me. And he looks at me and he says, you know what? I don't like niggers. I'm like, whoa, that's one heck of an introduction, buddy. <laughs> that voice kicks in and says, talk about that. I said, sir, when you say, when you use that word, what do you mean? He said, I, I mean, uneducated. I mean, ghetto, living off the system. I mean, um, you know, people who, who can't keep a job. And I said, sir, do you know any white people who fit that description? And he says, yeah. I said, how about those twins? And so we started talking about the twins and, and whatnot. And so then he, um, he later, during the conversation, leans over and says, you know what? I don't like niggers, but I like you. Now I'm confused because I'm not sure what I am to, to him, right? And so, so I said, sir, what, what is it about me that you like? And he said, I like the fact that you, uh, you're articulate, you have a good job, you have a good head on your shoulders, and you're just a really good guy. And I said, I appreciate that. I said, but what if all the people that you've met that you think look like me, all the ones you've already met that you think look like me were idiots, and all the other ones that you haven't met, all the people that you haven't met that look like me are just like me. And he looks at me and he says, I got to pee. So he gets up and he goes to the bathroom. Now I'm feeling pretty good because we've not had to have any altercations. We haven't, you know, had to have any interventions and, and whatnot. So I grab my walleye sandwich, I'm headed out the door, and guess who meets me at the door? It's this dude. But he's got water triplets on his face, his hair is combed over to the side, he has a damp napkin, and he reaches out to me with his damp napkin and he says, I raise fresh chickens. If you ever need eggs, give me a call. I take the napkin, I go my way, he goes his way, I never call him. But what happened for him? He saw me as a person. He started questioning maybe his stereotype. Maybe he started questioning his stereotype. Would you have understood if I gave that guy a piece of my mind? How dare you call me that? What, what are you doing? You don't do that to people. And what would that have done for him? It will reinforce everything that he thought about people who he thinks look like me. I'm not asking you to take disrespect. I'm not asking you to, to do what I do. I have a special call to do these kinds of things. What I am asking you to do is to be powerful in your spheres of influence. Don't hide behind your inferiority, your, your fear that you're not good enough, you don't know enough, because I will tell you, you don't. 
so be relieved. <laughs> My parents could have never taught me about sexting. You know, using the, the, set, the mm -hmm. sex on the phone. Right. Why could my parents not have taught me about that in the 70s? Because mm -hmm. it didn't exist. So you will never be quite prepared. <laughs> but know that you are the person that other people's liberties are locked behind. Your embarrassment is keeping other people locked up. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be ashamed. How many people have ever been on fire? Good. <laughs> but if you were on fire, do you know what to do? Stop, drop, and roll. And why do you know that and you've never been on fire? Because they taught you as a child, this is what you do. When we talk about this cultural competence stuff, we talk about this diversity stuff, why don't we treat that like we do being set on fire? Have conversations. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to say the wrong thing. Don't be embarrassed because I'm sure not all of you stop, drop, and roll like you're supposed to. It looks different, it's particularly when you're on fire. Right? And so looking at our humanities and the differences that we have are, is, is extremely important because it is by doing that that we're able to create opportunities for liberty for other folks. Last thing, back your, 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 your handout, there's dignity and honor of being human. That's what we should be aiming and striving for to give our, our clients. And lastly, is this idea of liberation. We've tried putting people on top of the table and putting people under the table. And then we said, you know what, let's switch those places and put those people on top of the table and put the other people on, on the bottom of the table. And then we said, let's all just get along and get on the table together. And then we said, you know what, we'll be separate but equal. And so you have that side of the table and I'll have this side of the table. No, let's all get on the same side of the table because we want the same thing. Things. But when does real liberation happen? When you get rid of the table. And so for our clients, we got to get rid of all of this stuff and know that we need to engage and protect their humanity. My name is Andre Cohen. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs>
I never knew a Dell phone stood until I lived there. You know, Dayton Date Electric Company. Oh, That's yeah, 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 yeah. And then all, you know, I had friends that worked for GM, but all that went away. Yeah. And, and NCR went away. So I yeah, it was NCR like, and Reynolds and Reynolds. Yeah, and yeah. So remember, because Forbes went away. You know, yeah. they, they made, when I was there, they made actually, you know, kind of business forms. Yep. Did some of that. Yeah, me, you did. Yeah. yeah. Reynolds and Reynolds, yeah. yeah. So, well, cool. yeah. so do your, do your parents still live in there? Yeah, my mom lives there, yeah. and uh, my sister, and then all my extended family is still yeah. there. So I don't get there as often as I'd like to yeah. or need to, but uh, try to do it every year or so. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. So, so here's one diversity story. Yes. So um, I booked a Tus Tuskegee Airmen to have their annual conference there. Now this would be in the 80s. Okay. So Tuskegee Airmen, they were still alive, but most of them are gone now. So we had the National Convention because Roy Cat and the Air Force Museum is there. So it's fun and to have them there. It's exciting. But then my meeting planner, who had worked with me for about two years prior to the convention coming, um, he passed away right before the convention. And so I wanted to go to his funeral. And so I went to his funeral. His funeral was at the Episcopal African American Church. Oh, yeah. And which is fine. And I felt comfortable. It's the first time I had ever been to church where I'm the only person that's white. Yeah. And I felt yeah. very welcome, okay. and I was glad I was there. And you know, I was, but it, that's yeah. the that's first time in my life yeah. as I came from yeah. a small yeah. town in Minnesota where there was okay. no diversity. Yeah. And I thought, I so if you have one, one yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Was good. But, sweet, right. sweet. but I was there for the yeah. yeah. man that I was working with, and yeah. so we would lost him. Yeah. But anyway, that's my name. Right. Well, well, great, yeah. great, great to see you. Thank you. Good to meet you as well. Wow, Andre. How are you? Okay. Good. Oh, Andre. Oh, two oh, weeks. So, oh, sweet. So, yeah, I was going to ask you for a card. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't. Yeah. Is it on your? Um, I wrote your name down in your website. Yeah. So it's that. That's the best way to get. Okay. All right. That's good. good. This is great. Good. 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 I know some folks were wrestling with some stuff. Um, it's good, and it's good to be uncomfortable and sit and and talk it through. So. Yeah. Yeah. So. No, that was, and thank you for bringing it up like you did because I think that's important too. Yeah, it's when we don't talk about it. Yes, yeah. that it festers and yeah, all sorts of stuff. Yeah. So, so no, I, I was fortunate to do this. I'm glad, uh, and it was so funny when I went on your website and I was like, oh, Nami, oh, I've been trying to get in their conferences and, and that kind of stuff. So yes, well, this this now was you know ten times better than, uh, than doing those things. So. This is great. Well, I'm in charge of our advancement marketing communications. Oh, so, so that's what I do. So I have a team of those people. So this is this is great. Great. So I'm excited well, to you. read more. Thank you, Andre. You're welcome. <laughs>